Hi, everyone. My name is Marika. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different from other talks uh, this week. Rather than give you a presentation, Cassie and I are just going to have a conversation. Um, there's so many ways to structure a research team to respond to strategic needs of both the R&D org and the UX research team. We didn't feel like telling you what to do, but rather share sort of conversation about where we um, ended up and why. Um, Cassie and I are both research leaders at LinkedIn. Um, Cassie leads a centralized horizontal UX research practice team, and I lead an embedded research team on one of our business units. And we're going to share a little bit about how we got here, how we work together, uh, some of the benefits of this setup, and also some of the challenges um, or opportunities, of course. Um, and if you're like me, you love hearing how UX research teams are organized and how they came to be. Um, Cassie, you've been on the research team at LinkedIn for almost seven years, at LinkedIn for even longer. Um, I'd love to know what it was like when you joined and how it's grown since. Yeah, thanks, Marika. Um, so when I joined LinkedIn, actually, it was nine years ago, I actually started as a market researcher uh, on the team. And we sat really close with the user research team, literally physically sat with them. There were three market researchers and four user researchers for all of LinkedIn at that time. Um, I felt so such kindred spirits when you're researchers, you just go gravitate and find out other researchers. That's just what we do. Um, and really complementary skill sets and methods, and but mostly a really shared perspective on how can we how can we create um, meaningful insights that create actionability for our product partners, right? That's the, the name of the game. So when there was an opportunity as the user research team started to grow, I was really fortunate that there opened up an opportunity to join the team as a manager. Um, and I moved across to the product organization, um, managing eight enterprise, just separate eight, sorry, eight separate enterprise product areas with three people. Uh, and if you do the math on that, you'll understand that's not possible. <laughs> um, and, you know, at that time, I was, for, again, fortunate that, um, like most of LinkedIn, we kind of went through this hyper growth moment. So we didn't, didn't stay there for very long. Um, but part of the game has always been in building, uh, building a team is that scale and leverage, the idea of scale and leverage. It's a constant repeat in my mind. What does it take at that time? It was to go from a zero to a one, from not much of anything to a lean something, if you will. Um, so now we're a team of 50. Fast forward, we're now a team of about 50, which is incredible to me. And I worked, as you mentioned, for about five and a half, six years on specific product areas. And, um, but always as part of that role is the need to continue to scale and leverage. And so I've always had a side gig kind of working on other things that are in service of the whole team, not just my particular product area. Um, and that's really instilled in me the need to create more thoughtfulness around what does it take to um, create more sophisticated process and tools, um, support that growing team, you know, continue to invest in our culture and our team and our uh, the, their development and what have you. Um, so I think about it, I have the opportunity now to kind of move into a role where I sit horizontally and I get to have that as my full time job, not just one of my side jobs, um, which I'm really excited to take on. Marika, you know, it's funny, I, we've known each other a long time, but you just joined LinkedIn about a year ago, which is incredible in and of itself. Um, I would love to think about, you know, given your background, why did you come to LinkedIn? Yeah, um, I joined uh, because of the problem space that I get to solve at LinkedIn, and maybe not surprisingly, given this talk, uh, specifically this team structure. Um, today, we have a centralized partnership model. So um, yes, we're a central UX research team, like uh, UX research has always been structured um, at LinkedIn within the design org, but we have three teams aligned with different business units um, and then a horizontal practice team. Um, I have a dedicated design and product partner. We get to go deep on our product space. I lead our talent solutions uh, research team, so think about um, the, the work side of LinkedIn, getting a job, learning on the job, but also hiring. And that has changed so much in the last two years. It's a really, really interesting space to do research in and to think about how our product can help people find the right next job for them. Um, and so I love that area. I was excited to kind of get to dig in uh, to that product space, but I was specifically looking for a role like this where I could have that autonomy to um, build my research team and work with my research team, leverage them to do awesome work, uh, but have the thought leadership and partnership from other research leaders to really think about what that means for our function and to not have to do it alone. Um, 
this structure is novel. I have not come across it uh, in, uh, in my job search, in, in my career. Um, I'd love to hear more about how the practice team came to be and what you hope to accomplish with it. Yeah, so as I mentioned, it's, it, you know, having, having done a lot of things on the side uh, as you build a team and, but always feeling like, oh, that, that, that could be a whole thing, like, but you're gonna just do part of a thing. And that, that feeling of, um, I don't know, giving it short shrift and just being actually frustrated, I'll be honest, frustrated by that and going, this deserves more, it deserves more attention and focus. Um, you know, when, I, when we were a team of 10 or 12, that was like, not even a thought, not even a whisper. It's it's very reactive and in the moment um, to what's the tool we need? What's the process that we need? Who are the people that we need? And you just kind of go and do it. Um, but looking ahead and going, okay, that doesn't work so well when you're a team of 50, you know, potentially a team of 70 to 100 in the next, say two to five years, that's, that's incredible to me. Um, and thinking about how do we change the game? So I had started doing this within my own product team uh, started looking at different ways to organize ourselves to create again just leverage and scale leverage and scale every single day um and how could we change our work style our organization models um think about differentiated types of work within the team for for the researchers on the team uh, and i pitched this idea when we kind of went through some organizational change anyway felt like a really timely moment to go well if we're going to do this big org change hey here's a crazy idea <laughs> uh, and i'm really grateful that our design leadership saw the vision that I proposed of like, let's, let's pull some stuff together. That is what a best in class world class research team needs to have foundationally. Um, so how can we focus on, you know, late stage research programs, I know we'll talk about in a minute, kind of the role of the embedded team, but but I had already started to see, you know, um, like many embedded teams, we we want research to be positioned as strategic partners working out in front. And yet the business demands and the, the expectation is, is that we're still shipping quality products. And so how do we kind of do a little bit of both? Um, how can we unblock the embedded teams to make that possible, make the deep you know, strategic work possible? Um, as part of our growing practice, you know, we've always had threads of inclusive research, but actually centralizing a tenant around inclusive research. What does it mean to center um, historically marginalized people in our research, making sure we're being thoughtful about vulnerable populations and how they're treated within a research experience and how they're represented within our um, insights to our partners. That was really, really important to us. Um, and so thinking about that more holistically than again, kind of sitting it somewhere in a specific business line just didn't make sense. Um, and then finally, if you think about just the team and talent was that opportunity to think about what is the learning and development that we need? You know, we've hired, because we've been really intentional about hiring um, really diverse backgrounds, talent, experience, skill sets, which is my favorite thing about this team is, you know, we're a beautiful patchwork quilt. Um, but it means that we also don't all come with the same foundational necessarily skills, experience, training. And so, you know, thinking really holistically um, as you are building a team, I have apprentices all the way to senior principal talent. What's the training that we need to provide? Um, so that was that's what I've been doing and trying what I'm trying to do with the practice. We call it the practice team, um, you know, creating this community of practice around research um, and what are all those foundational pieces that need to be in place to, again, support a, a growing, thriving team. When I talk to others about this, it's really interesting. I often get a question about, isn't that research operations? And um, so my own point of view is I have I am a big fan of research operations. And it's been interesting to see the evolution and rise of research operations as its own unique discipline in the last gosh, five to eight years, probably um, absolutely crucial partners to, and dependent on, our, on um, them for our success. But what I think I've realized or what we've decided within our organization is um, there's still this real need for research expertise around the problem space, around um, methods and tools around like scoping of a response, a solution, even within our own team to a problem. And so one of the things we've worked really hard on is aligning very closely. We collaborate really closely with our research operations partners, but taking a pretty firm position on where does research lead and ops supports versus projects or initiatives where it's really an operationally focused project and we're informing, consulting, advising, supporting. Um, and I think that's been 
working pretty well. That was definitely a learning for sure early on was just kind of creating those clear roles and responsibilities. Um, I will say one of the things that it's, it's wonderful that you and I are here today because we work together a lot already. And one of the reasons I have loved to do this is I'm a huge fan of our own team um, and wanting to enable, you know, drivers of growth and success for your team. And I'm curious now that you've work, been working with my team for a, a period of time, reflecting on, you know, my hypothesis, my hope had been is that this operating model would unlock opportunity for a team like yours, you know, allow you some space and your team some space to do things that maybe you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And I'm curious, is that, does that sound true or is that true? <laughs> um, or maybe an example of when it is, or if it's not, you know, of course I'll take that feedback, but I'd love to hear. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny uh, you ask it that way because I have described my new job to, to friends as being magical. Like we're <laughs> always being asked so much as a research leader, you talked about that being the like impetus for your team, right? We have to be people leaders. We have to be these uh, strategic partners to our product partners. Um, there's so much to think about and do. And then there's like process improvements. There's um, so much to think about um, uh, that's hard to do it all. And it's hard to be good at all of it. And so what I was hoping coming in that I mentioned is just the like partnership of like, oh, I just won't have to do it all. I'll do it all, but I don't have to do it all alone. Um, I didn't realize how much would really be, I can like, I can identify problems or opportunity areas that then um, your team can take and sort of build the foundation for, or sort of really help, uh, help drive. And that frees up so much space, not just for me, but also for the researchers on my team. Um, a recent example, uh, one of the managers from your team joined a planning meeting um, with my leadership team. We were kind of talking about what we what we want to do in the next quarter, of course, like what projects we want to take on and realize that we get a lot of feedback from the designers and product managers we work with directly. But I realized that I'm missing signal on who we're not hearing from. Um, and it was one of these great moments where the manager from your team, Kevin, was like, oh, we're actually planning to dig into that. Like we're doing our own internal research study to find out what are the needs we're missing, especially in design to start with? Um, and it was such a great like, oh, I can now just leverage the insights and findings from that and build on that for like what my team is unique and has its own unique needs, but I can build on that. Um, and really where it benefits that your team has researchers on the team who, who know how to tackle those problems. Um, I mentioned briefly that this there's a huge benefit also to researchers. One of the programs that uh, your team has set up, uh, we call Rapid Labs. Um, it's really uh, a program set up. Other companies do this too, right? A way for designers to do uh, prototype testing. The way we've set it up is that they are actually partnered with a researcher and it's a researcher from your team um, who supports uh, designers when they have sort of, they want maybe quick feedback. They, they have a lot of ideas and they want to increase their confidence in which direction to go, what pieces are working and not working. This is still research I expect researchers on my team to be able to do. They still have to do sometimes. It's not that we never use concepts or prototypes in our research, but that frees up so much space, not having to do all of it, not having to say no to all of those situations. Like we really unblock design and are able to go um, and go much deeper on some foundational questions. Um, and what's interesting, and I, I only recently started really um, vocalizing, sort of crystallizing, is that this really changes the role of the researchers to be much more of a strategist than just a researcher. And that's exciting. Like, this is what researchers want. Um, uh, you still need to be able to use and leverage a lot of different methods, but the ability to have that, like the time and space to go deep and be that partner and know that your design team is still going to be supported and that there's other methods and, and uh, ways to, to get them the answers and insights that they need. Yeah, it's a really lovely example. And in fact, just this morning, you and I were chatting a little bit about also stakeholder education materials. Right before this call, we were talking about stakeholder education materials. And one of the things I, I really thought about is if I could do this well, if our team can do this well, how there's this amazing um, complementary model in my mind that becomes almost this like infinity loop or figure eight, where it's like your team is, work, again, working way out in front, you know, you have the deep, you have to have a lot of context, product context, audience context, stakeholder context to work in an embedded team, right? And then really to let your team, you and your team focus in that, what it means to lead, insights for leading, right? Um, 
And so to the extent that we can unblock folks so that that's your focus, that's what you're worried about, that's what you're thinking about, and know that you have support, we're not gonna be able to cover all of it, but that we can help pick up things that are still important um, to our partners and our stakeholders and to our experiences, um, but that the tools, methods, techniques we might use are, they have uh, more flexibility, for instance, they could be more um, agile because they're scoped down in terms of not, not being ambiguous and broad and wide ranging, but we can create that nice like infinity loop idea of we, we're not leaving people out, we're not leaving any gaps, our teams feel support, our partner teams feel supported, our own team so much wants to provide insights and support for our partners. So everybody feels uncomfortable leaving things not done, right? And so how can we create that ongoing system of support um, uh, across, you know, but also create some cohesion, right? So there's, there is some common way that we think about how we're going to rapid labs as a program as an example of, I don't, we have three different major product pillars right now. In the future, I can imagine five, seven, 10. We don't need unique responses for rapid labs to every scenario. We can create common approach tools, you know, hiring programs to support, you know, what have you. It's a really great example. Yeah, I'm, um, makes sorry, me really, no, it makes me really excited about our future and how we can change the rate, way research is done together. Uh, I'm curious what you're focused on when it comes to growth and development of the UX research team this coming year. Yeah, I have a long, <laughs> I have a long list, as you know. Um, you know, one of the things that's really cool about stepping into research leadership, which I had not anticipated, is this like, just like design, just like product development is this continuous improvement cycle opportunity. And so there's always ways that we can think about it differently, do something better. Um, but one of the ones that's been, you know, pretty well pressure tested for us is um, the last several years of all working from home um, in the pandemic. And really, we had a lot of in-person research. We have research labs at our physical buildings. Um, and most of our teams were centralized around the research hubs, the, the R&D mm -hmm. hubs that we have. And so we've really moved, we've gotten very bullish on supporting remote and hybrid work um, as leaders in the field around you know, this discourse, like that's important to our team as well. Um, and I don't, I will say that like, I think, I think a lot about how do we do research best. And I think a lot of research teams are thinking about this, but in a hybrid environment, how do we work together, um, you know, asynchronously to maximize, you know, the time constraints and what have you. Um, and where can we offload certain things to be asynchronous versus you know, spending time together? We're very team in person culture. So, you know, making sure we're accounting for that um, connectivity, but ensuring we have other formats to tap into for folks, I think is really important. And then the other one that I've observed for my team specifically, you know, this is the, the risk of when you, when you have a bunch of stuff that doesn't have a home in, mm. in, um, in building a team is that it potentially all comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're like, hey, can your team just like, just like pick this up. Can you just take on this like one more thing? And it's a very one more thing um, risk. And so, you know, one of the things I know I've talked to you about, we've been talking across as a leadership team is really setting clear priorities, strategic yeah. priorities about, about, again, foundationally, what enables, what's going to most enable the team to all move forward. Um, where are those common points? Because I don't, I mean, we all have limited resources and capacity, including my team. Um, and so getting really crisp on that, you know, for each other and ourselves, my team also has a hard time because we all want to be helpful. Um, but making sure we're not overstretching ourselves because it's it's just not done or it's not done well otherwise. Um, so I think a lot about that. Um, I love when we get the opportunity to reflect on where we've been. Um, uh, but I'm also curious about what we're learning, why we've made certain choices, um, and thinking about what comes next. So I think you and I are really great at like reflecting and then possibility. And I would love to get your thoughts, especially as somebody who's got a fresh perspective on research at LinkedIn, you know, what are you seeing as next steps or opportunity spaces for us as a team? Yeah, 
um, it is uh, always uh, fun to, to think about where we could go. Uh, I'm really passionate about uh, informing the end-to-end -end product development process, including future innovation um, and just evaluation and making sure that what we execute and deliver is great. And you kind of touched on the goal of your team is to make sure that we can do all of that across it. I think it's the, the sort of extra and additional thing there is making sure that we're um, triangulating insights from multiple sources so that we're uh, leveraging not just UX research, but partnering really closely with data science and market research. And we have a customer experience team and product operations. And um, we have all these incredible insights functions at LinkedIn today. They're all supporting different business areas. Um, but what ends up happening is that all these insights fall on product management to make sense of when it comes to then what do we do about that in the product. Um, and one of the future scenarios that I'm excited about is what can we do to make that easier on product, to make it easier to then make a decision and see, especially when sometimes these signals, they like, sometimes they contradict. It's just hard to make sense. Like you're, you're not comparing apples to apples. So what can we do to work with these other insights functions and answer questions together, present a, a recommendation together? I think there's so much untapped potential there. I love that. Um... I know we have so much we have so much heart for all that possibility and what's to come. Um, I realized I'll be honest, I missed a question. So I want to make sure I give homage to the fact of I think some of the other possibilities I've heard you share with me. Um, also for the team, and you know, one of the it's a challenge and an opportunity, but is around, you know, some of the um the constraints that we've seen during the pandemic. I think I, I made yeah. a note of that is like in terms of our process and our methods and our tools of how we do research, but maybe reflecting on what you see as an opportunity. We're often we're often in that place as leaders on the team where we're playing the way I think about it is like building the plane while we're flying it. And you know, we're we're in flight. We're always in flight. Um, and but there is this piece of change management, you know, both from the the physical tools and ways that we might do something, but also the thinking for the team and how do we um, bring back some of the energy that we'd love to see uh, in 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 part of our culture. And I was curious, you know, as you th think about other opportunities for the team, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, and it's just been really hard to be novel and think creatively in the pandemic. And one of the things I've noticed, um, it helped me to start a new job, but that's not the right solution for everyone. And even that, it's like, it's hard to learn new ways of thinking and new ways of doing. And one of the coping mechanisms is to figure out a way to make work work for you today. And so we've gotten really comfortable with our setup and our way of working and the methods that we use. And I would love to infuse a bit more of that like experimentational mindset, not just in how we build product, but in how we do research. And it's the stuff that makes research fun, but it's like, how do we, how can we be a little bit more nimble? And this is hard because I just shared how incredible it is that researchers get to be more strategic and go deep. But then what do you, like, can we change what you do in your downtime as a researcher? And like, what do we, how do you still sort of be there for your partners? Um, and I think that's another opportunity where I think our teams can partner really closely together to figure out like, what is that right balance in your workload, balance in your calendar? If you think about a year, like how many big projects do you take on? What do you do when you're waiting for recruitment to come in? Um, like there's just so, there's, there's so many lulls and I feel like we've gotten, um, there's an opportunity there to be creative in what we do. I love that. I um, plus one, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's why you know I so enjoy our partnership. Is we love to bounce ideas, obviously off, off each other, and, and I think you know you and I have the opportunity to also see some of the common patterns that are happening across teams. It's not just my team or your team. You can we can kind of triangulate that even amongst ourselves. Um, and spur innovation and, you know, maybe just to wrap up some of the cultural things that I know you and I have gotten to partner on, including this talk today, um, things that we do within our research community to, yeah, bring that essence and spirit of experimentation, um, fun, innovation, these are all part of our culture. Um, and so I'm so grateful to get the opportunity to partner with you, Marika, 
Um, I could talk to you, as, as you know, all day about this topic um, and about org design, which I know we nerd out on tremendously um, and what it takes to run a world-class research team. And I'm so grateful that you and I are on this journey together and supporting one another um, in that mission. So thank you. Um, I would love to just wrap up the time and express gratitude to, to, to the UXDX organizers and community for having Rika and I today. Thank you. Um, we would love to hear what others are trying, what you're experiencing, what's what's helping, <laughs> uh, you know, what's um, really meaningfully moving your practice forward. I think that's such a great opportunity for us to share as a community. That's the intent which we're bringing forward some of our insights and um, challenges as well. Um, and both, both Marika and I are, of course, on LinkedIn, and we would love to hear from you and keep the conversation going. So thank you. Thanks.